Hello all, thank you for uh, working with me uh, given the situation with my travel. I wanted to thank you for uh, allowing me to do this presentation through um, PowerPoint online. Um, so tonight's lecture will be, uh, we'll be discussing dengue virus disease and um, we, what will happen is this, I will give this lecture quickly and then very similar to the way we've been doing the, the course throughout the whole semester, um, I'll give an introduction to the issues and we will then, um, rather than group work, I will give you a list of questions for you to answer um, and then I'd like you to basically fill out one to two pages um, describing the question that I have for dengue in this case um, and then for guinea worm eradication for the next lecture. But I just wanted to go over first dengue and what the disease is and then what some of the issues are. Uh, so unlike some of the other diseases that we've talked to, which have been mostly parasitic diseases, dengue is actually a virus. So the biology of this is so much different than the other diseases we've discussed about. Um, it is a virus that is in the flavivirus um, family and genus, and it has four different serotypes, basically four different subtypes, dengue 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, it's very important that you understand that there's four different serotypes because the pathology of the disease depends on how these different serotypes you get infected with. So what is it? Dengue virus is the first disease that we actually, viral disease that we actually talk about and it's uh, also very, very um, similar to LF in that it's mosquito-borne. Uh, the um, particular mosquito species that is the um, pathogen that causes the disease is Aedes aegypti, which is probably one of the most common mosquitoes throughout the whole world. Um, there's two different forms of the disease, dengue fever and then dem uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, dem dengue hemorrhagic fever can lead into dem dengue shock syndrome. We'll discuss all these a little bit later, um, but just understanding the severity it, it increases with severity between DF, DHF, and DSS. Dengue is transmitted primarily by the, or exclusively by the uh, female mosquito, as is most diseases. They're the only ones that really bite. Um, unlike malaria, for instance, however, um, it's primarily a daytime feeder. So think about the different types of, of um, prevention strategies that you might incorporate for dengue virus um, prevention strategies, such as bed nets. It may not work for that situation because people are not typically in bed during the day. Um, and then also it lives around human habitation. Unlike the other, some of the other diseases which will live in the forests or uh, like near river areas, uh, dengue virus mosquitoes actually tend to live more around the urban areas. And they lay eggs and produce larvae prefer preferentially in artificial containers. So again, you don't typically see them in, um, you won't typically see them in the rivers or by the lakesides, but you will see them a lot in the urban areas in small little containers, such as tires and pots, trash piles, anything that can like hold cups, so anything that can hold small amounts of water, typically they like that. Uh, it gives them a little bit more seclusion from predators uh, eating the larvae, so that's something to think about as well. Dengue virus uh, is seen in, in um, many ways to be uh, the uh, um, averse of malaria, uh, as we mentioned before, it's uh, typically done, uh, transmitted in cities versus malaria, which is rural areas. And while the Anopheles mosquito is the primary mosquito that bites uh, for malaria, which bites at night, Aedes bites typically during the day. And while the initial malaria infection generally produces more severe symptoms, you usually get acute malaria, dengue typically has uh, a, a less acute sy symptoms, but then when you get infected a second time, uh, that's when you start to get into the dengue, dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock, shock syndrome. And usually it involves a different serotype. This is why the four different serotypes is important because if you get infected by one serotype, you might develop some immunity to that. But then when you have a, uh, the second serotypes, what ends up actually happening is, is you get a hyperimmune response and that can actually exacerbate the whole process. Dengue fever can be painful. Um, it usually is painful when you have uh, symptoms of dengue and of the uh, more severe dengue fever. And it's also been given the name breakbone fever. Think of it like the worst flu you ever had in your life times 10. Um, and it can be extremely debilitating, but it's generally not life-threatening and usually will subside on its own. But it is the worst flu you ever had. Um, and, and it can be extremely painful. Uh, however, some of the severe manifestations that arise uh, can be more one from more than one infection, uh, which would lead to the he uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Again, this is a hyperimmune response, 
um, in which you actually get hemorrhagic responses, uh, which we'll talk about some of those those different responses in, in, a, in a little bit. But um, it is especially a problem in younger children um, and younger adults because they tend to be the ones that are more walking around. So dengue hemorrhagic fever. This is the more severe after you've been infected a second time by a, a second uh, serotype. And this can have very symptoms such as very similar symptoms as dengue fever, such as fever, headache, muscle and joint pain, dehydration. But where it starts to really become a problem is when you start to get the, um, the epitaxis, the bleeding from the nose, the mouth, the gums, the hematuria, the blood, uh, pain behind the eyes, plasma leakage, and all of this is the, basically what the hemorrhagic aspect is. And it can be life-threatening. It's extremely painful at the very least and can be very, very life-threatening. Um, so. What are some of the epidemiological factors of, of dengue virus? Um, there are more than 2.5 billion people that are living at risk um, of the disease. 100 million cases of dengue are affected each year, and almost 500,000 uh, cases of those are dengue hemorrhagic fever. The fatality rate of DHF is 5%, uh, so it's fairly large, 5% of 500,000. And dengue um, people are, the most people that are at risk of the hemorrhagic fever and dengue virus are children and, and the elderly. Um, as I mentioned before, the young adults included in that. But the working age population is not as, as high of a risk as with most of the other NTDs that we saw. Um, what's interesting about this is that the elderly is at risk, um, which is generally you don't see that with the other NTDs that we discussed, um, but that is one of the cases. And just the, uh, the figure on the right-hand side just shows the average number of dengue cases um, per year reported by WHO between 1955 and, 19, and 2007. That number is still going up. It's sort of plateauing a little bit, but just because population increases, the number is actually still increasing. So what are the areas that are most infected? You can see here it's pretty much the tropics. Um, pretty much any area in the... Uh, in the tropical area within those two red squiggly lines. Um, and then the countries that are most affected are the ones that are in the orange. Um, there are cases of, uh, of dengue in the countries that are not orange, but if you can see, most of those are in more arid populations or higher altitude. So the mosquito vectors are not as common in those areas, and that's primarily the reason why. Um, see the of these notes on the left um, just the thing that you want to be aware of is that it does cover pretty much everywhere in the world in the tropics so it's not exclusive to Africa uh, a lot of it in South and Central America and a lot of it in Southeast Asia um, and then also the mosquito remains infective for up to three weeks during the course of its life so what is the pathogenesis of infection and process of dengue so humans are usually the initially infected through the mosquito vector we talked about that um, the interaction of the cell incurs uh, primarily targets are phagocytes. You don't need to know the details of this. Just know basically that it kind of has this, um, the, the individual receptors you don't need to know, but just understand that the cycle is basically human to man, human to man, and there are animal vectors involved as well, uh, animal reservoirs, I should say. Uh, the disease course, um, there's three main phases. You have the febrile, the critical, and the recovery. You have that acute, you know, that low-level acute phase, but it's usually not as acute as I mentioned with malaria. But the critical stages is where if you've been infected before, you get the toxic, you get the um, toxic, uh, uh, hemorrhagic toxic, dengue toxic hemorrhagic aspect of it, which can be a problem and life-threatening, and then just the de dengue hemorrhagic uh, fever as well, which is the shot uh, occurs during the critical. Typically what you'll get is, is you'll get an immune response after that and uh, you, you'll get recovery. But again, if you don't die from the hemorrhagic aspect, um, and uh, you usually do make a full recovery. What are the diagnostic tests available? Um, very, very few and very expensive. Unlike some of the other ones that we've discussed, they're very difficult. They're usually, uh, they're all pretty much, um, uh, they're all pretty much diagnostic to based, a sero serological diagnostic based, uh, which include virus isolation by the mosquito. Um, you can inf uh, infect the mice to actually see if they've been in, uh, infected with the uh, virus. Detection of uh, antibodies in the blood by PCR, viral isolation, serology, very expensive. ELISA is another way you can do it. Um, some of the less um, less serological or um, 
Um, Molecular-based diagnostics include looking at um, the blood itself, if you have raised hematocrit or thrombocytopenia, uh, not necessarily di uh, high specificity, but they can give you an idea of the infection. Um, if you want high specificity, you really need to get to the ELISAs or the PCR methods. So what are the treatments? Um, as of right now, there is no treatment available for dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue fever. Um, there is no treatment for the actual disease, um, and there is no vaccine available. Some vaccines are being tested. In fact, there's a couple of large-scale vaccine tests being conducted right now um, throughout the world on some of these countries. Uh, in a lot of countries, they're doing different tests, but none of them have reached uh, you know, past, past phase three. Treatment. Um, the available treatments that are there are for really relieving the symptoms and the complications. Uh, replacement of plasma if you have hemorrhagic fever, um, sedative, blood transfusions, and then aspirins and various painkillers for uh, dealing with the pain aspects. The big thing you want to focus on when you're dealing with dengue is more the prevention strategies. Uh, what can you do to eliminate the breeding areas of the mosquitoes? What actions can you do to prevent them from biting? And then uh, we mentioned the vaccines that hopefully will be uh, online in the next five years um, available for a large-scale distribution. But as of right now, it deals mostly with the prevention using uh, how do you prevent the mosquitoes from breeding or how do you kill them, and then also how do you prevent the mosquitoes from biting. So what are the, some of the controls that we can use? Um, to reduce the female vector density uh, below the epidemic levels uh, will not occur, so how can we deal with it? Based on the assumption that eliminating or reducing the numbers of the habitats in the domestic areas can control it, we want to focus on the domestic areas. Um, and what I mean by this is I mentioned that a lot of this is in the urban areas with small containers, so you want to eliminate the mosquitoes breeding sources, such as covering water containers. Um, anything that like septic tanks, you have in a lot of developing countries, you just have open sewer lines. So shutting them, blocking them off. Uh, removal of trash, you'll often see in a lot of developing countries, again, a lot of trash piles just collecting on the side of the road, making sure that those are burned every day or somehow they're removed into a local trash dump. And then biological control, such as um, dealing with uh, adding such fish that can eat the eat the larvae into the various ponds in the in the uh, in the urban areas, and then chemical tr control. You want to use as less as possible um, because they have uh, environmental side effects. But you can use various larvicides um, and uh, mosquito control killing as as aspects. Um, just for a history lesson, real quick. I think I mentioned this in a previous lecture, but um, DDT is extremely effective in killing mosquitoes. The environmental aspects of it are problematic, but if you do small uh, concentrated spraying of DDT, it actually can be very effective. Prevent the mosquito bites, basically mosquito repellent. Uh, mosquito nets, uh, we're not talking about necessarily bed nets, um, but things like anything that you can have with a permethrin coat that would actually have an insecticide on it. Um, on the windows, on the door frames, screens on the windows, um, as well as uh, repellents, D-E-E-T, or DEET is another effective uh, method that you can use to spray uh, yourself with a mosquito repellent. And you may not think about this, you know, I mean, at an everyday basis, I mean, people don't like the feel of the mosquito repellent, it's kind of greasy, but if you're living in a high endemic area during, you might want to consider having that as available during high time periods where the infection may be happening, if you're having an outbreak or a situation or something like that. Um, you would actually want to advise them to do it every day, but the reality is, is that you have to think about what people would actually realistically do. Um, provisions of reliable water, uh, reliable refuge uh, collection, house-to-house -house inspections to control mosquitoes, house-to-house -house spraying, and then education campaigns are also extremely critical. So after you've actually implemented your strategy, how do you actually surveil do surveillance? Uh, contact tracing and in epidemiological investigations on diseases. You want to look at, you want to have people going into the communities and seeing um, if they've been infected, if they might be staying home. You don't know if they're going necessarily to a hospital. So you actually want you might need to go into the communities. If they are coming to the hospitals, you need to understand where they're coming from so you can go back and find out what's going on. And then you also want to make sure that you're liaising with all of the appropriate health and, and uh, and relevant departments, the Food and Drug Administrations, uh, the Environmental Control uh, Departments, the Health Departments, and so on. And then you also want to collaborate, make sure you collaborate with all the hospitals, uh, any health clinics, 
um, as well as the pharmacies, because again, the people may not be going to the hospital, so they might just go to the pharmacy to pick up uh, painkillers uh, dealing with the deng dengue fever itself. Again, it's you may not need hospitalization. It's like the flu. It's, it's extremely painful, so they may be only getting painkillers. So you need to keep an eye on that as well. And then you need to make uh, close liaisons with the nearby regions and overseas countries, especially if the outbreak is happening um, near a border area. You need to understand what's going on in, in other countries and other regions um, to see what's happening from an epidemiological point of view. And then you have to make announcements and have good communications with the general public on reported cases um, and then how you're going to deal with the preventive measures. You don't necessarily want people just coming in, spraying you know, around someone's house. They might wonder what's going on. So proper education and proper communication is extremely critical with uh, dealing with surveillance as well as the implementation of the program. And that's really it for today's lecture. Um, I just wanted to thank you again. I appreciate you uh, um, having to listen to this rather than in person. And I encourage you, if you have any questions, please email me um, anytime. I'm usually fairly quick with replying to emails. So, um, uh, and uh, we will do, I will have out the questions for this week as well um, for you to answer. And please send that back to me as soon as possible. Again, thank you for your time and uh, have a good day.